Time after time, we've been promised the appearance of pop star Cyndi Lauper. A lot of people showed their true colors throughout the entire ordeal, but it seems finally someone has had a change of heart, as tonight we get to she-bop with Cyndi Lauper. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance Rants. I am your host, Tyler Vance himself. It is June 16th, 1984. Last week, the wrestling world was ablaze with the talk of how Rowdy Roddy Piper smashed a coconut into Jimmy Superfly Snooka's head during the middle of Piper's pit. But instead of WWF Championship Wrestling, this week we're going to tune into Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling first. The familiar voice of Bob Cottle immediately greets us on commentary as we're treated to a match between Brian Adidas and Jesse Barr while the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, the Nature Boy Ric Flair, joins Cottle on guest commentary. Barr attacks Adidas from behind to get things started and remains almost in complete control for the entire match. But Brian manages to reverse a suplex from Jesse into a pin to get the first win of the week. Backstage, Bob Cottle tries to interview the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Ric Flair, and they try to discuss the topic of Dirty Dick Slater, the true and legitimate NWA World Heavyweight Champion, if you ask anybody with some intellect, before they are interrupted by the NWA Television Champion, Tully Blanchard. Blanchard requests to take over interview duties, something that Bob Cottle has absolutely no problems with, and so he hands the microphone over to somebody more experienced. According to Blanchard, since both he and Flair are champions in their own right, that means they have some things in common. Money, clothing, women. You and I have, have a lot of, lot of things in common. Women, jewelry, clothes, the fine life. However, the Nature Boy counters that the NWA television champion's wardrobe simply cannot compare to the one that the world heavyweight champion wears. You certainly couldn't classify this as being the same wardrobe as this. Tag team action is next, which sees the Road Warriors, Animal and Hawk, taking on the team of Sam Houston and Dale Vesey. Tully Blanchard joins Bob Cottle on commentary. However, with the way that the match goes, they don't have much to discuss at all. The Road Warriors maintain complete control, constantly keeping the flow of tags up and fluid. A devastating clothesline from Animal secures he and Hawk the win. Rufus R. Freight Train Jones goes against Bobby Bass in singles competition next. During the match, Bob Cottle asks Tully Blanchard when the next time he will be defending his NWA Television Championship. When are we going to see Tully Blanchard defended on television? I tell no, not you too, Bob. Not you too. A headbutt from the Freight Train puts Bass down for the count. Brian Adidas is backstage with Bob Cottle next, and he takes the opportunity to discuss his win over Jesse Barr earlier, who just so happens to be a protege of the big cat, Ernie Ladd. Adidas apparently took offense to the fact that Jesse Barr attacked him from behind as the match began, and all I have to say in response to that is, that sounds like a skill issue on your end, Brian. Brian Adidas then makes a statement that he is accepting NWA television champion Tully Blanchard's challenge for a chance at the championship itself, as well as $10,000 of Blanchard's own money. I don't know, Adidas. You struggled against Jesse Barr, and now you think you're good enough to go up against somebody like Tully Blanchard? <laughs> okay, pal. And you know, it's weird, Bob. I haven't seen a man since he's won the television belt. I haven't seen him put it up against a worthy contender. Or, for that matter, I don't even know that he's put it up. He sure has. On April 7th, Tully Blanchard defended the NWA Television Championship against Brickhouse Brown. Maybe you should do some research before you start spouting some gossip and rumors, Brian. You named yourself after a shoe. Shut up. The NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, the Masked Outlaw, is in singles competition next against Gene Ligon. Before the match, the Masked Outlaw uses his whip that he normally brings down to the ring to scare the audience into submission. All right, fans, you're watching right there in the ring, the Masked Outlaw, and he has that whip. Being one of Dory Funk Jr.'s protégés, it's no surprise to see the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion control the match from the mat once the bell rings. A rising knee lift puts Ligon down for good, who then tries to go to attack Gary Hart after the match. He 
he gets caught by the masked outlaw and then gets whipped like a dog for his efforts. Gonna whip him. Here's Ligon, flat on his face, out in the ring, being whipped. Backstage once more, Paul Jones and the Assassin are Bob Cottle's next guests. The Assassin is absolutely sick and tired of the American dream talking about his humble beginnings. For those of you not in the know, which I'm kind of surprised if you don't considering that's all he ever talks about, Dusty Rhodes lived in practical poverty growing up, being the son of a plumber, and had to fight tooth and nail for his spot currently in the world of professional wrestling something that he's very proud of. The assassin, however, not so much. Paul Jones ends the interview with somewhat of a warning to those names still left on the hit list, leaving the Mid-Atlantic Championship area and heading elsewhere, whether it's in the NWA, the WWF, or abroad, will not save them from Jones's wrath. They are deluded, and being a man of wealth, Mr. Jones can take himself as well as the assassin anywhere they please to hunt these people down. Words are great, but actions are definitely better, and that's something that the Assassin and I agree on. He heads down to the ring with Paul Jones at his side to take on Mark Fleming. The Assassin is all over Mark, giving him absolutely no room to breathe whatsoever. Fleming does manage to get a near fall on the Assassin following a drop kick, but it's to no avail. As the match progresses and Mark Fleming hangs on for dear life, the referee begins to berate the assassin for one reason or another, so Paul Jones takes it upon himself to smack Mark in the face with his cane. This causes another distraction for the referee, who then begins to berate Paul Jones. This causes the assassin to put a metal plate up into his mask, which puts Mark Fleming down for the count. To finish off Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Bob Cottle brings up the true and legitimate NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Dirty Dick Slater. Recently, Slater and Ricky Steamboat competed for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship. However, the match ended in a no contest. Slater says that it will come down to who has the most guts. And with regards to Ricky Steamboat... But Steamboat, you ain't got a gut in your body when it comes right down to it! Slater wants to have one more match with Steamboat for the United States Heavyweight Championship. However, to sweeten the deal, the Dirty One has added a stipulation. If Slater fails to beat Steamboat for the United States Heavyweight Championship, he will leave the Mid-Atlantic area and won't be heard from again. All Ricky has to do is sign the dotted line. Paul Jones and the Assassin have one final thing to talk to Bob Cottle about, who begins the interview by asking why they did Mark Fleming dirty the way that they did just a few moments ago. Why would you do something like that against a man like Mark Fleming? Yeah, Bob. You know, I could go on for hours and hours, but I really don't know what you're talking about. There was a lot going on, Bob. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but all I saw was the assassin use a clear and legitimate headbutt to secure the win. A final warning is sent out to both number one and number two on the hit list in the form of the boogie woogie maniac Jimmy Valiant and the American Dream Dusty Rhodes. Their days are numbered. With Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling at an end, let's tune into WWF's Championship Wrestling Show and see what's going on up north. The WWF Intercontinental Champion Tito Santana is taking on Cowboy Bob Orton in a non-title match to start things off. Mean Gene Okerlund and Lord Alfred Hayes are calling a commentary, but before the match can begin properly, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor begins to play throughout the arena. <laughs> It's just the WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan. And why is he out here, you might ask? Well, he's here to shake Tito Santana's hand as well as pander to the crowd before he disappears backstage again. Bye, Hulkster. Make sure to leave the championship behind. I'll make sure the cowboy takes good care of it. A prolonged feeling out period starts things off between Santana and Orton before quickly devolving into a fist fight. The Intercontinental Champion's flying forearm since both he and Orton outside of the ring, and neither are able to get back in before the referee finally does do his job and counts to 10. It's a double count out, and I immediately blame Hulk Hogan. You're familiar with Butcher Paul Vachon by now, but who you might not be familiar with is his older brother, Mad Dog Vachon. How does a human being get to be known as the Mad Dog? 
Well, he grew up in a poor family of 13 and often went without food, so he had to scrounge his own, and that led to some altercations in the streets. Not a tad dig out of a garbage can. Not, not really out of a gar not literally out of a garbage can. Have you ever been on gray? Have you ever gone to bed on gray, mister? Wow, Gene, you really are mean. While backstage being interviewed by Okerlund, the Mad Dog states that he does not have any friends and does not want any, considering the fact that they'll just end up stabbing him in the back. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and the Mad Dog takes no chances. I am now convinced that somebody at WWF headquarters has it out for Billy Travis. Week after week, he's practically been sent out to die against the WWF's, no, wrestling's best performers. And this week is no different as Billy Travis takes on Jesse the Body Ventura one-on-one. -on -one. Now off coming that, well that's different. He just took his shirt off, Gene. Relax. You really are on a roll tonight, aren't you? Domination is the only way I can describe this match. The body hits Travis with a massive slap that sends him right down to the mat. Here's an old veteran. He's the whole and a second one echoes throughout the arena. Well, a third one practically collapses Billy's trachea. Followed with a series. Ventura gets Travis to submit with a reverse body vice. It's power versus scientific wrestling next as Dr. D, David Schultz, and B. Brian Blair head to the ring. Dr. D tries to be a good sport in trying to shake Brian's hand as the match begins, but his efforts are ignored. Here this week over Dr. David Schultz, could certainly... A double backbreaker from Dr. Schultz almost secures him the win, but Brian does manage to get his foot on the ropes, forcing a break. Blair manages to make a brief comeback, exploding with a flurry of moves, but he gets caught in a pin by Dr. D, who puts his foot on the ropes to get some leverage and the 1-2-3. B. Brian Blair is furious that he lost fair and square, and so he screams for Dr. D to get back in the ring, something that goes ignored. Feels bad, doesn't it? Vince McMahon's WWF update once more focuses on the WWF World Heavyweight Champion, Hulk Hogan, who apparently has been spending a lot of time in Hollywood recently, especially in the company of one Brooke Shields. What's the matter, Vince? Is that... it can't be jealousy again? Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and Rudy Diamond are facing off against each other in singles competition, and while Mr. Wonderful makes his way down to the ring, Rudy tries to make a name for himself by encouraging the crowd to chant Paula. Rudy Diamond, the opponent of Paul Orndorff. Vince McMahon replaces Lord Alfred Hayes on commentary for this one, and then Rudy Diamond simply vanishes. No, I'm, I'm serious, he vanishes, he heads backstage. Forfeit for Mr. Wonderful. You know, instead of doing his job like he should, the referee does not count out or declare a forfeit like I mentioned against Rudy Diamond. Instead, the NWA effect again remains in full swing as he simply stands around like a goof waiting for Diamond to return. When Rudy Diamond does return, he returns wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with the word Paula on it. This is outrageous. This infuriates Orndorff, who chases Rudy around the ring in an attempt to rip the shirt off of his back. Unable to remove the shirt, Mr. Wonderful decides to take all of his fury out on Rudy Diamond, decimating him with the nastiest pile driver I've ever seen. The polish shirt is then finally ripped from Rudy's body before he's given a second pile driver. Then he is mercifully pinned, and it just proves that diamonds aren't forever. Mean Gene Okerlund then catches Paul Orndorff for an interview, and according to Mr. Wonderful, he takes the Paula chance as a genuine insult, and anyone caught doing so going forward are going to suffer the same consequences that Rudy Diamond just did. You have been warned. Okerlund then asks Orndorff where he thinks he can get off doing things like that, and I just have to ask, were you not listening to a single word Mr. Wonderful just said, Gene? Paula. Paula. That's where he gets off. Go back to the AWA. Rowdy Roddy Piper has accomplished what no one in the WWF ever could. He has booked Cindy Lauper to appear on Piper's Pit, 
and she is here. Miss Cindy Lauper herself! <laughs> Miss Lauper has flown 7,000 miles, 11,265 kilometers in real measurement, just to be here on Piper's Pit. And she shares something in common with Roddy Piper. We both have something in common. We are both number one at what we do. So here's where things get a little confusing. For weeks now, we've heard Captain Lou Albano come out and talk about how he is the manager to Cindy Lauper, and because of his actions, her career has skyrocketed. This was first countered by some goofball cab driver named Dave Wolf, who says that he's the real manager of Cindy Lauper. Well, now that the woman is here, we can hear it from her mouth. Who is the real manager of Cindy Lauper? Wait, yes, no, I love Lou, but he's not my manager. A lot of people think that. Wait, what? You're not saying that Captain Lou Albano is a liar, are you, Cindy? Being good friends with Captain Lou Albano, Rowdy Roddy Piper's temper begins to flare. But before things can get out of hand, the captain himself shows up to put the matter at rest. Cindy, sweetheart, how you been, baby? How you doing? Cindy, tell all these people out here how I took you, Cindy, and found you in New York City and Queens, and how I made you a superstar. The whole situation goes south, and Cindy Lauper acts with such disgrace when she not only throws Piper's pit's table onto the ground, but then hits the host, Roddy Piper, and Captain Lou Albano with her purse as WWF Championship Wrestling goes off the air. I, you can't come out here and tell me that this man is a liar. I'm not calling him a liar. I don't want to get mad. Now, don't get me mad. Tell him how I took you abroad, hanging around New York. What? I don't want to get mad. I don't know what to think. We are always told that celebrities can do no wrong and say no wrong. Yet here is Cindy Lauper saying, that Captain Lou Albano is a liar, hitting him, and then making up own false accusations on her own. Who am I, and who are you, supposed to believe? If you ask Rowdy Rowdy Piper, Cindy Lauper is the liar, and any offense taken on Captain Lou Albano's end automatically is offense taken on the hot rod's end. One thing is for sure. This most definitely will not be the last time that we see the Cindy Lauper Captain Lou Albano controversy flare up. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tyler Vance France. Don't forget to like the video, hit the bell, and subscribe so you're always notified when a new episode is released. You can also follow me on social media where I hope you'll share the video with your family and friends. Plus, there's plenty of wrestling goodness for you to check out there. That's it for me for this week. I'll see you next week. So long for now. Something that Bob has had no issues with recently. Why did I say recently? Paul Jones and the Assassin have one final thing to say to Bob Cottle, who begins questioning, questioning, and this cake, and this cake, what cake? There's no cake.